This is the story of how, with the stroke of a pen, a fledgling America doubled its size and became a world power almost overnight. Our story recounts how this, more than any single event, would forever alter the course of our nation's history. It was a time of global conflict. The Americans had just won independence from England. France was recovering from its own revolution. The powers of Europe were facing war on the continent while seeking to expand their empires beyond the boundaries of their own shores. Spain, England, and France had laid claim to territory in this so-called new world across the sea. The American colonists, newly independent, were trying to make their own way. Thomas Jefferson knew that in order to continue our westward expansion and to secure the lifeline of trade, we had to control the Mississippi River, and that meant the port of New Orleans. Then, as if to fulfill what some would come to call our manifest destiny, a sequence of events coincided to present us the opportunity of a lifetime. And at a bold move, our country entered into what's been called the greatest real estate transaction of all time, known simply as the Louisiana Purchase. We acquired more than 800,000 square miles for $15 million. That's about four cents an acre for a territory whose natural resources held riches beyond anyone's ability to calculate. As General Horatio Gates said to President Jefferson, July 18, 1803, let the land rejoice, for you have bought Louisiana for a song. When we think of Louisiana as we know it today, it's hard to imagine that it was once a vast territory stretching west across the plains to the Rocky Mountains and north from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the Canadian border. With the addition of an area greater than all of Western Europe, the United States suddenly became one of the largest nations in the world. Ultimately, all or part of 15 states would be carved out of the lands of the Louisiana Territory. Louisiana, April 30th, 1812. Missouri, August 10th, 1821. Arkansas, June 15th, 1836. Texas, December 29th, 1845. Iowa, December 28th, 1846. Minnesota, May 11th, 1858. Kansas, January 29th, 1861. Nebraska, March 1st, 1867. Colorado, August 1st, 1876. North Dakota, November 2nd, 1889. South Dakota, November 2nd, 1889. Montana, November 8th, 1889. Wyoming, July 10th, 1890. Oklahoma, November 16th, 1907. New Mexico, January 6th, 1912. When I think the Louisiana Purchase is, um, represents the great moment where the United States starts defining itself um, in new terms. It's no longer looking east, the country starts looking west. The Louisiana Purchase has so defined the, the way we understand American history since that time, that it's very difficult, frankly, for us to think about um, what the place might have been like if it hadn't have happened. Through the heart of this story, like the center of the country, runs the Mississippi River. Well, if you were a farmer in what was known as the Old Northwest Territory, there was no way to get your crops to the East Coast. So what you often did for trade purposes was go down the Ohio River, then down to the port of New Orleans. Things came down in, in flatboats and bateaus and, and 
barges and things like that, the goods that were being exported out of the uh, interior of the continent, had to be transferred to ocean-going vessels in order to be um, shipped abroad. And, and you want to be able to bring your goods ashore here in New Orleans. It was called the right of deposit. So you can see how important New Orleans was for that whole group of people, what was then the Western United States. And New Orleans was king in 1803. On the 16th of October, the intendant, who was the uh, Spanish official here in New Orleans, issued an edict closing the river to American trade. What it does is it just absolutely outrages all of the Americans. Call it coincidence or providence, the culmination of events converged for an instant, and we were fortunate enough to seize the moment. The Louisiana Purchase is a combination of a few things. It just happened in fluke circumstances that the French had a great setback in Haiti and um, they started realizing it was being much harder to have an empire over in the New World than they thought there would be. And in fact, Napoleon was outfitting an expedition to take control of Louisiana. And what happens is that all of those troops and all of that preparation gets swallowed up in the debacle of uh, Saint-Domingue. 54,000 out of 60,000 troops died. So once Napoleon's expedition collapses, within a matter of weeks, he was set on selling the colony. For a year before the final transfer of the territory, Jefferson had started writing notes to French intellectuals. And in those notes, he would say, we have to control New Orleans. I'm afraid if we won't, it might mean war with France. I, Jefferson, love France. Uh, you know, the moment that France takes possession of New Orleans, we have to marry ourselves to the British fleet and all of this sort of dire consequences. Jefferson uh, entrusts to DuPont a a letter that he sends to Livingston with the hope that not only will he carry the letter to Livingston, but also through his own channels, uh, bring pressure to bear on Napoleon. So he was doing, if you'd like, psychological warfare, not directly to Napoleon, knowing these, these missives of his would sort of seep into the palace and, and Napoleon would read them. Word of all these things is, is really coming to bear on Napoleon, and Napoleon has essentially decided to give up Louisiana and go back to war with England, and for that he needs money. So, we have Livingston and Monroe, thousands of miles from their president, faced with a momentous proposition far beyond anything for which they had been prepared or authorized to undertake. I think the wisdom of Jefferson's handling of his diplomats comes from the fact that he had been in Paris in the 1780s as our representative. So he knew firsthand what it was like to be in a foreign place when events were happening quickly, and he was essentially 12 weeks uh, out of touch with his government. So what Jefferson did is he brought Livingston to Washington and they spent uh, the better part of a week together talking over all kinds of what we call scenarios. So that by the time Livingston left, he knew Jefferson's thinking inside and out. Uh, Jefferson does exactly the same thing with Monroe. And as a result, when those guys are over there, um, they know the president's mind. They have a certain confidence to make the best of, of opportunities rather than feeling bound by written instructions. So due to those circumstances, there's the famous scene where Napoleon kind of finally throws at Livingston and Monroe. You know, well, what would you give us for all of Louisiana? Monroe's physical presence in Paris is an indication that Jefferson cared enough that he sort of send really one of his own. The fact that Monroe was there to back Livingston up meant a great deal. Monroe quickly also realized that this was an opportunity to seize. They had to take Napoleon's offer up at once before he reneged on the offer, and they moved with great speed. They didn't even know whether they had a constitutional mandate to do such a thing, but they did know one thing. Livingston, in particular, knew the mind of Thomas Jefferson, and he knew that that mind would want all of the Louisiana territory. And I think without the wisdom of that approach to the diplomacy, the opportunity for the Louisiana Purchase uh, could well have come and gone and just been missed. Today we take for granted the obvious benefits of the Louisiana Purchase, but at the time not everyone could see it. Spending a fortune we didn't have for all that undeveloped wilderness and the idea of incorporating all those new people caused quite a few to question the wisdom and the legality of the decision. Federalist in New England including congressmen, said that they would resign from U.S. Congress if Jefferson went through with this kind of purchase because they were so worried it was going to destroy the country. The question of constitutionality that, that really worried 
Jefferson and his, and his contemporaries has to do with whether it's right for the government, which has been set up as a compact between 13 states, to admit these other people into their union. One of the things that I think is fascinating about the transfer ceremony in, in December of 1803 is that after the ceremony, Wilkinson, Pierre Clement Lausanne, and W.C.C. Claiborne walk out onto the balcony to watch as the French tricolor flag is brought down and the American flag goes up. And they look out and suddenly they're encountering the diversity of New Orleans and particularly the, the diversity of New Orleans in terms of race and ethnicity. It's this encounter with diversity on the part of what's predominantly white male Protestant East Coast world of the first two centuries of American history is kind of uh, a metaphor for our subsequent two centuries of American history. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that maybe uh, uh, people who reflect upon the meaning of the Louisiana Purchase will be able to recognize that there are more than two categories of, uh, of, of Americans and that, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can see ourselves in a little bit clearer light uh, with that kind of a vision. The blending of cultures in Louisiana was the beginning of the great melting pot America was to become. The Louisiana Purchase means so much more than the greatest real estate deal in history. It assured our place among the powers of the world and provided us the inspiration to explore, to expand westward and beyond. In no small measure, the Louisiana Purchase served to shape the future of our nation.